Uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, I'm Arosha Isamayake. I'm the president for the Ceylon College of Physicians. A warm welcome to all uh, online participants of this uh, specialty update. As you know, this is the month of July, and the month of July is the month of rheumatology for the CCP. Uh, we have divided the year to a different specialty in each month. And as you know, that we've been throughout there, we've been having similar programs. And this month is very rich in rheumatology. We've already had a college lecture uh, early part of this month. And then this is the second in the rheumatology thing. We usually have two activities. That is a specialty update. And then tomorrow we have a very special lecture from an overseas expert and that's called the cutting edge lecture, where some where, uh, resource person is going to speak to us on precision medicine, treating psoriatic arthropathy. Then, of course, final item will be the rheumatology quiz, uh, which will uh, permit you all to win some prizes if you can answer and get good marks. So those are the four items on uh, each month. And then this is the specialty update. We have four eminent rheumatologists who are joining us uh, today to discuss various topics. And then to co-chair this session, it is my great pleasure and privilege to invite Dr. Gurinda Desimu, who is the president of the College of Rheumatologists and Rehabilitation Specialist. So Duminda will be co-chairing this session with me, and then Duminda will be introducing the speakers. The speakers will speak for about 25 minutes, and then we'll have about five minutes of this Q&A. You can write in the questions uh, into the chat box, and then the Minda will pick, pick them up and uh, direct them to the relevant speakers. So we will have four such topics, and we are trying to have it from 11 to 1. I hope you all have a very fruitful time. If anybody missed the college lecture earlier this month, it's available on the CCB uh, YouTube channel. And then I again invite you all to, me, uh, to join tomorrow evening in the night uh, for the cutting edge lecture as well. So we'll have a lot of rheumatology, some very, very good rheumatology today. Uh, over to Duminda to conduct the program from now on. So thank you once more for joining this morning. Over to you, Duminda. Okay. Thank you, Arosha. Uh, it's a great pleasure to conduct this uh, uh, specialty update on rheumatology today. I thank the president and the uh, Ceylon College of Physicians for inviting us. Today, our first speaker is Dr. Kalum Deshapriya, and he's uh, consultant, uh, consultant in rheumatology and uh, medical rehabilitation attached to uh, teaching hospital Kara Pitya currently. He is the former president, College of Specialists in Rheumatology and Rehabilitation, Sri Lanka, former president of uh, Gold Medical Association, and he's the country representative of spondyloarthritis special interest group and the working group member of the psoriatic arthritis management guidelines of uh, APLA uh, 2022. Uh, Dr. Kalam Deshapriya will be talking on spondyloarthritis disease with a long diagnostic delay. Over to you, Kalam. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me share my... Uh, good morning to everybody. So I would like to thank the presidents uh, and the councils of the two colleges and the organizing committee for inviting me to deliver this lecture today. Thank you very much. So what I will be going to discuss during the next 20 minutes or so will be on arthritis. Almost every day, I'm sure all of us see patients with arthritis. The question that we will be asking from us is what is this arthritis? What is the type of arthritis? We see different types of arthritis in different presentations. So my aim is to uh, discuss briefly about what is meant by diagnostic delay, how important is it, especially in relation to spondyloarthritis. Uh, about the diagnosis, the most importantly, the, my presentation will focus on how to diagnose spondyloarthritis. We feel as a college that the, uh, the knowledge and the awareness among our medical fraternity is still not satisfactory, not good with regard to spondyloarthritis compared to the other inflammatory arthritis. 
so i think it is really important for us to know what is spondyloarthritis how to diagnose it so my main discussion will be on the diagnosis and introducing spondyloarthritis to the audience rather than the management and then i will be briefly discuss about the challenges in the diagnosis okay uh, what is diagnostic delay how do you define that uh, the diagnosis delay is the time interval between the onset of symptoms to the diagnosis that is the diagnostic delay and we also talk about the term called window of opportunity that is the symptom onset to the initiation of treatment in order to achieve the best outcome that is the window of opportunity so we have to diagnose the patient and start our treatment to get the best outcome the diagnostic delay uh, occurs in two different levels in the patient's delay and in the health system delay what is patient delay the period from the onset of the first symptom to the first medical consultation there is a delay in many diseases so almost all the diseases the health system delay that is the period from the first consultation to the date of diagnosis there's a delay in the health system as well so we'll talk about that so diagnostic delay can happen in two different levels the patient delay health care delay and health care delay happens in two sides actually the gp or the physicians delay and the health system delay so what are the possible causes the patient delay the maybe the patient is not ignoring the symptoms and not seeking the medical advice just wait and sometimes we see patients choosing the health care provider to whom to go to take the medical care so in our country there are various places where the patients can go government hospital general practitioners and private consultation the specialist consultation and there are other uh, health uh, ayurvedic then other uh, types of uh, medical care and the health care providers and people used to go to these places as well so there is a delay and the lack of continuity to follow up when the patient feels better they stop taking the treatment continuously or follow up is interrupted then interrupted care due to the response to the treatment whenever a patient feels better sometimes the patient stop taking treatment there is no proper follow up so these are some of the patients related factors where the delay can happen and then at the physician level when the diagnosis is difficult when there is a wide differential diagnosis it takes time to diagnose lack of awareness or the knowledge about the current position of the disease is another cause ignoring the importance of certain symptoms we do see patients but ignore the importance of certain symptoms that may be huge uh, mistake that sometimes in a very important disease you sometimes ignore the very important physical signs or symptoms and then delay in referral to the specialist care these are some of the reasons why there is a delay the health system there is no proper referral system there is a long waiting list in the clinic even if the patient comes the diagnosis delayed due to the waiting list availability of investigations appropriate investigation in the health sector so these are some of the factors that lead to diagnostic delay these are some of the examples of the duration of diagnostic delay in certain diseases in pulmonary tuberculosis more than 5 months hypertension sometimes this is the mean average of 5 years there is a delay in the case of rheumatoid arthritis there is a delay of about 1 to 3 years in spondyloarthritis and it is generally more than 6 years or 10 years in certain studies it goes up to 20 years the delay what about the window of opportunity to get the best outcome we have to initiate our treatment as early as possible for a, in the case of stroke especially in rehabilitation you have to start to get the rehabilitation to get the maximum the best outcome at least within two and some says even two weeks 
and rheumatoid arthritis, the window of opportunity is only three months. To get the best outcome, we have only three months. In the case of spondyloarthritis, we still don't know the window of opportunity. Right. Now, we'll uh, begin with a case history. Now, these are the type of patients we, I'm sure all of you must be seeing almost every day. The patient with chronic back pain, and maybe this type of patient presenting with knee pain and the back pain, very common in our practice. So this is the history. This is a 44-year-old male laborer, and he comes with episodic chronic back pain for seven to eight years, several episodes of painful swelling of the knee, regular follow-up, no regular follow-up, because whenever he takes treatment, he responds well, and then he stops taking treatment. So he goes to the doctor only when he gets the next episode. There is no proper follow-up. So he remembers giving an injection to his right heel five years ago. He had no medical problems, other medical problems. Examination except for mild diffuse tendons at the lower back, and also mild knee abusion. The examination was unremarkable. High ESR, high CRP, and he comes with a lumbosacral spine X-ray, which is normal. The question is, could this be a case of spondyloarthritis? Okay, so what is spondyloarthritis? It is a chronic inflammatory disease. Unlike in other inflammatory arthritis, the characteristic feature in spondyloarthritis is the presence of NTSITIS. Apart from synovitis, which we see in all the other inflammatory arthritis. In addition to that, the classical feature is the enthesitis. I'm sure all of you know what it is, what enthesitis is. The two classical examples are the Achilles tendonitis and the plantar fasciitis. The presence of enthesitis is the classical feature. So there are five subtypes, ankylosis spondylitis, psoriatic, inflammatory bowel disease associated, reactive arthritis, or undifferentiated. And clinically, you have the axial spondyloarthritis or the peripheral spondyloarthritis. The word spondyloarthritis actually means inflammation of the spine. So it is the axial spine, that is the, the spine and the sacroiliac joint, predominantly affecting compared to the uh, other joints. When you have the predominant axial involvement, you call peripheral spondyloarthritis. The, when the Axial spine is uh, the peripheral joints are affected more commonly than the axial spine. You call peripheral spondyloarthritis. In the axial spondyloarthritis, uh, there are two varieties. One is called radiographic spondyloarthritis. When there is sacroiliitis on the X-ray, that is radiographic spondyloarthritis. When the X-ray is normal, but if, if you do the MRI, MRI will show evidence of sacroiliitis. You call non-radiographic or pre-radiographic spondyloarthritis. There are considerable overlap between this axial and the peripheral spondyloarthritis. So this is how you classify or the diagnose. You have to have a patient with inflammatory spinal pain or arthritis. Arthritis is classically asymmetrical arthritis in all the large joints in the lower limb. So if you have a patient with either back pain or arthritis with one or more spondyloarthritis features. So this is the one that I have got to express in my presentation mostly. What are the spondyloarthritis features? So how do we diagnose rheumatoid arthritis? We look for features of rheumatoid arthritis. It is a bilateral symmetrical arthritis with hand involvement is predominant. Small joints affected more than, and the presentation is generally a large number of joints. So that is a classical presentation of rheumatoid arthritis. When you have a patient with this, you don't diagnose anything else. It is rheumatoid. But similarly, we have spondyloarthritis features. What are they? So the patient, this I said now, this is a disease of spine, spine, axial spine. So it is a patient who is having features of inflammatory back pain. So what is inflammatory back pain? Classically, it has to be in a young patient. Age of onset of this back pain should be in a younger age, less than 40 or 45 years. And with features of inflammation, insidious onset, improvement, or so like that. So in a young patient with 
chronic back pain lasts in more than three months. So that is the inflammatory back pain. That itself is a clinical feature of spondyloarthritis. And alternating buttock pain. That is the patient experiences pain in one buttock at a given time, and it completely goes off and experiences the pain on the other buttock. So that is a feature of early sacroiliitis. It's a classical feature. If you inquire from the patients, they will come out with these clinical features. The problem is that we don't ask these questions. Another classical feature of spondyloarthritis is the presence of the good response to NSAID. Generally, we know that inflammatory arthritis is generally difficult to control with NSAIDs. However, to give NSAID, the pain persists unless you give steroid or get the disease under control. But in the case of spondyloarthritis, they respond dramatically to NSAID if you give a good dose within 24 to 48 hours. This quick response to NSAID is a feature of spondyloarthritis. Ask for this feature. Then the arthritis is just the opposite of rheumatoid arthritis. It is asymmetrical, oligoarthritis, predominantly in the lower limbs and large joints more than the small joints. That is a classical arthritis. The presence of enthesitis, not necessarily during the current presentation, even in the past. Uh, so you ask about this history. Dactylitis, very characteristic feature of spondyloarthritis. If you happen to see dactylitis in a patient, you don't suspect any other diagnosis, suspect always spondyloarthritis. The full length of the finger or the toe is in pain, or the sausage-shaped finger, dactylitis. And then you look for the exoskeletal manifestation, like psoriasis, features of inflammatory bowel disease, uveitis, and past history of uh, infection, preceding infection. And when there is a family, first or second degree, relative having these diseases, is a feature of spondyloarthritis. You suspect them as having spondyloarthritis if the first or second degree relative having these diseases. Positive, uh, the elevated C-reactive protein and the presence of HLA B27 as an investigation. So these are the features of spondyloarthritis. This is all what I want you to carry today. So you should be aware of what are spondyloarthritis features. And these are the important features. Whenever you suspect possible spond uh, the spondyloarthritis, look, ask for these features. Then you apply the criteria and then try to diagnose spondyloarthritis. So, uh, so this is peripheral spondyloarthritis. You don't have to remember it is available in. Uh, uh, it is available. You have to just to refer whenever you suspect these patients as having spondyloarthritis. And this is the axial spondyloarthritis. Now all these you have to apply these spondyloarthritis features into the classification. So most important thing is you have to know about spondyloarthritis features. Right, now we'll come back to this patient. If this is spondyloarthritis, so we'll try to pick important clinical features in this patient. The ones in red, the 44 year old, his back pain started seven to eight years before. So that age of back pain is correct. So if you have elicited that this back pain is fulfilling characteristic of inflammatory back pain. So it is important to take the history, see whether this is an inflammatory type of back pain and painful setting of the knee. You might disregard this as mechanical pain or mechanical osteoarthritis type of knee effusion due to his activities. But in the if the patient is having all the other features of uh, the spondyloarthritis, this is significant. And he says whenever he get a NSAID, he responds well, so he stops taking treatment. So good response to NSAID is a feature of spondyloarthritis. So he remember an injection, maybe plantar fasciitis has been injected in the past, and tenderness at the lower back. So if you carefully elicit the physical sign of sacroiliitis, the way that you are going to elicit sacroiliitis, you will pick these two. 
the mild knee effusion there may be features of inflammation so this is a patient with high esr high crp but the wrong x ray the x ray would have been not the lumbar sacral spine but the x ray of the sacroiliac joint or the sacroiliac wave if you have done the correct x ray you will diagnose so he has more than large number of spondyloarthritis features so there are enough reason for us to suspect spondyloarthritis in this patient so this is a very likely patient that will be missed in our everyday practice right so what are the challenges in the diagnosis so these are some of the reasons lack of pathognomonic clinical features or reliable biomarkers like in any other inflammatory or connective tissue diseases but hla b27 and crp and mri in the case of sacroiliitis will be useful lack of validated diagnostic criteria more than that we are not aware of this diagnostic or the classification criteria we don't refer to this classification criteria in our day to day practice so i suggest that you uh, start doing these things and you will diagnose more and more spondyloarthritis patient in your clinical practice delay in referral to the rheumatology clinic and this is quite common and there's a long diagnostic delay anyway due to uh, various reason uh, so these are some of the reasons why the diagnosis is delayed this is more so compared to peripheral arthritis and it is more in axial spondyloarthritis the delay is more peripheral arthritis they there is a delay but they present much earlier than axial spondyloarthritis so there are challenges in relation to availability of the investigation facilities that will make the diagnosis late and interpretation of the imaging modality is not that easy that the expertise uh, to read correctly the sacroiliitis and the mri sometimes ultrasound scanning that need uh, the expertise to read this spondyloarthritis related features so these are few i am not going to talk about the management but these are some of the principles so it is important that you have to identify spondyloarthritis as a potentially severe and disabling chronic disease the treatment should be started as early as possible like in any other inflammatory disease multidisciplinary approach and should be managed in collaboration with relevant specialty the skin uh, uh, gastrointestinal physicians in the case of uh, uh inflammatory bowel disease and psoriasis treatment objective are to improve the quality of life prevent structural damage and preserve or restore function uh, functional capabilities to do that we have to diagnose them early so diagnostic delay should be we must try to uh, diagnose these patients as early as possible delay has to be prevented so these are some of the take home messages there's a very long diagnostic delay be aware of the spondyloarthritis features but i would like you to stress few spondyloarthritis features inflammatory type of back pain in a young patient low limb oligoarthritis presence of enthesitis and dactylitis pay special attention maybe you are dealing with a case of spondyloarthritis and i request all of you to refer these patients to the rheumatology clinic early thank you thank you very much kalum uh, for the excellent presentation uh, if there are any questions like i mean this q and a panel is empty uh, perhaps you have answered most of the queries uh, yes, this is the time for you to ask yep uh, may may i ask one question kalum right yes, uh, yes. Uh, what is the place of conventional synthetic dmars like methotrexate or sulfasalazine uh, in sacroiliitis yeah uh, so there is a current evidence say that now and we generally use to say that now there is no place for uh, conventional uh, uh, disease modifying drugs in the case of axial spondyloarthritis but there are uh, certain studies now say that there is a place for even in uh, axial spondyloarthritis but the evidence is not that strong 
but there are evidence to say that now they are being useful uh, but evidence is not that strong still okay thank you okay. then there is one question can a patient have an have an inflammatory type backache without other spondyloarthritis with normal esi and crp yeah i suppose yes any 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 combination is possible yeah but yes. is, uh, what is most important is don't discharge this patient from your follow up follow up this patient and he might develop the features later on but anyway you have to treat the patient as uh, with the available uh, clinical features and the investigation findings yeah that is quite possible but it is important yeah. to follow up this patient right thank you very much kalum again for the lovely presentation so we'll move on to the next speaker uh, our next speaker is dr monica de silva uh, dr monica de silva is a consultant rheumatologist in national hospital of sri lanka she is also an honorary senior lecturer in the faculty of medicine university of colombo and she is the immediate past president of college of specialists in rheumatology and rehabilitation she graduated from university of peradeniya and had md from uh, pgim and completed fellowship in rheumatology in university of alberta edmonton vasculitis is one of her special interest and pioneer to begin a vasculitis registry in sri lanka she also has several publications in the field of rheumatology so dr monica de silva will be talking on immune complex mediated vasculitis today uh, to you monica good morning to all of you um, first of all i would like to thank presidents and council for college of ceylon college of physicians and college of specialists in rheumatology and rehabilitation for inviting me to do this presentation so i'll be talking on immune complex mediated vasculitis uh, so we talk about uh, anka vasculitis large vessel vasculitis Uh, I uh, so it's, um, I thought it's better to speak on immune complex mediated vasculitis. So in next twenty to twenty five minutes, I'll be um, concentrating on this bit. I'll introduce what is immune mediated immune complex mediated vasculitis, and I'll describe briefly the types and uh, touch upon the management. So it's a heterogeneous group, and it's characterized by deposition of immunoglobulin. or complement so both on the vessel wall causing subsequent destruction of the vessel wall and it's a predominantly small vessel vasculitis um, and skin involvement is universal it's mostly in the form of purpura but maybe as urticaria um, nodules or even ulcers skin biopsy uh, classic finding is leukocytoplastic vasculitis so if you see what is leukocytoplastic vasculitis it's a very familiar familiar to all of you i think and um, they are there's a destruction of vessel wall due to infiltration of inflammatory cells um, classically neutrophils and uh, there is neutrophil degra degradation of neutrophils with accumulation of nuclear dust that's called leuco leukocytoplasm leukocytoplasia and fibrinoid necrosis of vessel walls also seen and uh, to get maximum yield uh, it's necessary to do biopsy of, of fresh lesion uh, lesion so 18 to 24 hours and if it is more than 48 hours it will show mostly it can show lymphocyte infiltration and in that addition there can be red cell extravasation and this is not not specific to immune mediated complex vasculitis can be seen in small vasculitis of anka vasculitis as well but direct immunofluorescence is helpful to differentiate in anka vasculitis there will be hardly any immune complex uh, hardly any immunofluorescence and it's uh, important to differentiate uh, iga vasculitis where there can be deposits of iga seen with immunofluorescence and in sle related vasculitis there can be diffuse immunofluorescence uh, this 2012 revised chapel hill consensus conference nomenclature uh, this diagram is familiar to you and there are four types of immune complex small vessel vasculitis which are primary of origin iga vasculitis cryoglomerular vasculitis hypocompatibility urticarial vasculitis and anti glomerular 
brain disease. So these affect typically small vessels, arterioles, capillary, and venules. And the associated small vessel vasculitis also affect these small vessels. And you know this, uh, I'm not going to talk about vasculitis, MPA, GPA, and EGPA. So these were the primary uh, four types I just mentioned. What is the primary types of vasculitis, immune complex median, but there are secondary vasculitis disease as well. The immune complex mediated vasculitis can be secondary to uh, associated systemic disease to SLE or rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, or sarcoid. Uh, also, maybe um, with other etiology, like maybe drug me due to drugs or infection or in malignancy. So, first we talk about IgA vasculitis, which was known as kind of Shonlin purpura earlier. So it's due to production of abnormal IgA1 isotype. So that's galactose deficient IgA1. So there's autoantibody synthesis towards this IgA1 abnormal type and subsequent immune complex um, formation. And these immunocomplexes deposited in the, in the organs resulting in damage. So this is the commonest vasculitis in children, about two, about 20 per 100,000, but in adults it's less than two per 100,000. Uh, typically, uh, typically present as this classic trial, palpable purpura, arthritis, so arthralgia and gastrointestinal involvement. Uh, palpable purpura is symmetrically distributed in lower limbs and it has to be differentiated from uh, other hemorrhagic lesions, TTP or ITP, and arthritis is uh, or arthritis. That's usually there's no overt arthritis, but there can be pain in the ankles and knees with difficulty in walking. Gastrointestinal involvement is usually in the form of colic abdominal pain, uh, usually after about two to ten days after the appearance of the rash, but it can occur before the appearance of rash make uh, have with the diagnostic confusion. So it may also present a single organ disease with either cutaneous or renal limited. So IgA vasculitis, um, when it uh, occurs in adults, it involves renal, this renal involvement is more frequent, but it's a rare cause of uh, renal involvement in adults. So usually in the form of microscopic hematuria with subnephrotic uh, proteinuria, but there can be even um, impairment of renal functions and hypertension at the beginning. Uh, light microscopy showing only the mesangial hypertrophy and mesangial hypercellularity, but in, in, with immunofluorescence, IgA deposits can be seen in the glomerulus as well as um, in the skin bi biopsy with immunofluorescence. So treatment, uh, so steroids are not effective for the skin. Um, Colchicin, Dapsone, and Montelukast may be effective, but these also do not prevent the relapses. But steroids are effective on joints as well as gastrointestinal manifestation. If, if there's renal involvement, it, uh, the management depend on the, depend on the presentation. If it is only isolated hematuria, just follow up if necessary for 10 years. And if there's hematuria with subnephrotic proteinuria, high-dose steroids are needed for six months. And if there's rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, steroids and cyclophosphamide are indicated. But if there's severe renal impairment, there's no need of immunosuppression. Um, cryoglobulin vasculitis. Um, so you know cryoglobulins are immunoglobulin, which precipitate in lower body, lower temperatures than 37 degrees. So there are three types of cryoglobulin, type one, type two, and type three. Type one is monoclonal antibodies, which is uh, uh, with B cell proliferative diseases uh, like multiple myeloma, golden strong uh, microglobulinemia, and, or monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined origin. Um, so these type one, these cause symptoms, in type 1 cryoglobulin vasculitis, 
or type 1 cryoglobulinia, the symptoms are due to hyperviscosity. But in type 2 or type 3, um, this causes immune complex mediated vasculitis. So this can be due to chronic infections like hepatitis C viral infection, or B cell proliferative diseases, or autoimmune diseases, or without any other cause when it is called essential mix in its call essential cryoglobulinemia. So type two antibodies are of IgM. These are monoclonal antibodies with uh, rheumatoid factor activity. In type three, these are chronic polyclonal IgM with rheumatoid factor activity. Um, so cryoglobin vasculitis is also small vessel vasculitis. And typically, it's measures trial, the presentation, weakness, weakness in um, may, there may be uh, peripheral neuropathy with, uh, with isolated sensory or sensory motor with arthralgia and purpura. And renal involvement is usually proteinuria, subnephrotic proteinuria with microscopic hematuria, but there can be nephrotic syndrome or nephritic syndrome as well. Main pathology in renal biopsy is type 1 membrane proliferative um, glomerulonephritis with subendothelial deposit. So, this is uh, one of the pictures of lower limbs in one of our patients who presented, who was referred to us from as dermatology with history of recurrent uh, purpural crash, mainly over the lower limbs, but uh, it's with some spots in upper body as well. So this is a, another patient whom we uh, manage as cryoglobin vasculitis. This patient, 60-year-old woman, and uh, presented with a uh, history of recurrent rash over two years. So she was getting the, these purpuric spots like over two years duration, like once in two or three days and disappears and getting recurrences. So she got admitted to a medical ward uh, with history of fever of only two days, but she had history of weight loss almost three months with 10 kilogram weight loss and on admission found to have uh, proteinuria. And she also developed numbness in the right hand and feet with foot drop after the admission. So she also had one episode of um, seizure while in the ward. So th this was the, her investigation with very high ESR and CRP and um, and uh, UFR showing red cells with uh, proteinuria, UPCR showing nephrotic range proteinuria, and rheumatoid factor is also was positive, and and can a never negative. However, her C4 was low. That's typically seen in cryoglobulin vasculitis. Um, somehow, repeatedly, her cryoglobulins were negative. However, hepatitis B and C also were negative. Um, her skin biopsy showed leukocytes plastic vasculitis and renal biopsy showed diffuse proliferation. And MRI, there were multiple lacuna infarcts. And nerve conduction study, in addition to peripheral neuropathy, there was monouritis multiplex. And serum plot in erectoporosis showed abnormal monoclonal band. However, bone marrow was normal with only 2% of plasma cells. Uh, we treated her uh, with uh, IV methylprednisolone, one gram three days, followed by one milligram per kg. Her fever responded to methylprednisolone. So as she was having uh, mononeuritis multiplex and subnephrotic proteinuria, she was started on uh, cyclophosphamide vasculitis dose. However, there was no improvement of um, proteinuria or mononeuritis multiplex with cyclophosphamide. So when she when we started her own retoximab, 500 milligram IV weekly three doses, uh, her food drop improved and proteinuria disappeared. So after that, so once this in uh, once now she's on remission and on MMA. And after two years, we had to give another retoximab dose when she presented with a severe rash. So how do we treat cryoglobin vasculitis? So if there's organ threatening disease, RPGA, non-nephrotic syndrome, we have to start immediate immunosuppression. Uh, in the hepatitis C uh, virus associated cryoglobin vasculitis, we can start immunosuppression without, uh, because it doesn't cause a flare of the hepatitis C infection. 
However, if it is your hepatitis B or hepatitis or HIV associated cryoglobulin vasculitis, we have to um, eradicate uh, with treatment the viral, we have to treat viremia before starting immunosuppression. And um, so there's limited evidence for cyclophosphamide. So that's why probably the, that our patient also didn't respond to cyclophosphamide, but uh, there is enough evidence for rituximab and steroids. So either if it is um, autoimmune disease or cryoglobin vasculitis or um, lymphoproliferative disease associated vasculitis or hepatitis C associated vasculitis. So we can start um, rituximab. So if there is organ threatening disease. So let's talk about antiglomerular the basement membrane disease, earlier known as good pastures disease. This is again a rare disease less than two per million people. And they are the pathogenic, anti, pathogenic antibodies uh, against the non-collagenous domain of alpha-3 chain. So antiglomerular basement membrane consists of this type 4 collagen. And um, so when there, the, when there, though this is expressed mainly in the kidneys and um, alveolar capillary membrane, so that's why it affects kidneys and um, lungs. So majority present with rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, which is usually without uh, prodromal symptoms. Like in ankylosculitis, we see um, patients having weight loss and fever and other symptoms before getting the, the RPGN. But in antiglomerular membrane disease, so they can have abrupt onset of RPGN and about 40 to 60% of patients also can have pulmonary hemorrhage. So that's why it's important doing any patient with RPGN, uh, this anti-gomerular membrane, um, anti-gomerular basement membrane antibodies. So treatment is this removal of this pathogenic antibody. So how do we confirm the diagnosis by detecting the anti-gomerular basement antibody? And the renal biopsy also shows typical changes uh, presence of cellular crescent and immunofluorescence showing ribbon-like bands. And here, so unlike in ankylosculitis, so need, they no, these patients don't need long-term treatment, right maintenance of remission, just uh, plasma exchange to remove this pathogenic antibody and uh, short courses of steroids and cyclophosphamide. The treatment may be necessary only three to six months. So, but remember, some, sometimes there can be double positivity, the patient with PNK positivity, but they may need to treat as NK vasculitis. And um, as this is vasculitis, I just want to mention, even in NK vasculitis, when there is severe renal involvement, uh, that means um, if serum plate in more than 300 micromoles per liter, or when there is pulmonary hemorrhage with hypoxia, plasma exchange may be indicated. So the fourth type of um, primary immune complex mediated vasculitis is hypocomplementemic urticaria vasculitis. Their presentation is with recurrent urticaria. And these uh, urticaria patches um, usually last more than 24 hours and uh, associated with itching or pain. And um, in addition to urticaria, there can be other organ, other organ involvement. Um, maybe there may be angioedema and cardiorespiratory involvement with asthma, COPD, or pleural or pericardial effusion, and renal involvement, gastrointestinal involvement, and ocular involvement in the form of um, episcleritis or uveitis. Um, so that's why there, is, there can be overlap with the presentation. There can be like uh, overlap features with SLE. And typically, the, for the diagnosis, the serum complement, lower serum complement levels are needed, and majority can have anti C1Q antibodies also. So, 50% of patients initially diagnosed as hypocomplementemic urticaria vasculitis um, can um, later be diagnosed as SLE. So, I mentioned there are secondary vasculitis, immune complex mediated. So, these are Autoimmune disease can be autoimmune disease associated, SLE, Sjogren's, rheumatoid arthritis. So often there are uh, clinical features of underlying disease present. Um, 
So they need escalation of treatment if the patient is already diagnosed, but rarely uh, vasculitis may be the initial presentation of SLE. In rheumatoid arthritis, vasculitis, rheumatoid vasculitis is rare. Uh, early it was seen when the, the, when the steroids are used often in the treatment, but now we see the, we rarely see rheumatoid vasculitis and usually see years after the diagnosis. So this is one of the patients whom we see with Sjogren syndrome vasculitis. This was a patient whom um, referred to us from nephrology due to history of microscopic hematuria. They have done the renal biopsy and renal biopsy there's only interstitial nephritis. And the patient had vasculitic rash for almost four years and biopsy showing leukocytoplastic vasculitis. And on direct questioning, the patient had dry eyes but there was no dry mouth. She also had peripheral neuropathy, which was going on for several years. And um, she had mild respiratory symptoms. So as incidental finding, so we, uh, there were thin or cysts in the lung. Her ANA was positive and anterior and la both were positive, confirming the diagnosis of Sjogren syndrome. And she responded to steroids, uh, micropenate morphotil and high treatment with hydroxychloroquine. So, uh, Immune complex mediated vasculitis can be drug induced, particular drugs, even the vaccines or food additives, all these can induce vasculitis. Typically seen about one to three weeks after introduction of a new drug. And most of the drugs can cause um, drug induced vasculitis. However, there's another form of vasculitis and comediated, um, uh, like um, antithyroid drugs. Propyethyroid, this can cause kind of vasculitis, which is not immune complex mediated vasculitis. The, co the most common drug uh, causing immune mediated vasculitis are um, penicillins, sulfonamides, NSAIDs, diuretics, TNF alpha inhibitors. But there are no pathognomonic features. So, high degree of suspicion is needed. Usually, it's mild and they can have fever, mild arthritis, the but they, really there can be other organ involvement as well. So immune complex mediated vasculitis can be secondary to infection. That it, it's important to know. So in this chronic viremia or bacteremia uh, uh, can cause vasculitis due to accumulation of uh, antigen, antigen antibody complexes, and then antigen antibody complexes uh, deposition in the affected organs. So it can be due to chronic viremia with hepatitis B or C or even HIV. And um, particularly in subbacterial bacterial endocarditis, when there is antigen exists, there can be immune complex formation and secondary vasculitis. And sometimes streptococcal and staphylococcal in infections, usually after one to three weeks after infection, there can be urtic, uh, like urtic area or a kind of uh, immune-mediated vasculitis, which may be difficult to differentiate from drug-induced vasculitis if they were started on penicillin, no other antibiotics for these infections. And here the management is treatment of underlying infection. But in some instances, there may be um, indication for immunosuppression, plus or minus, steroids, plus or minus in immunosuppression. Vasculitis, uh, immunocomplex mediates can be secondary to malignancy as well. So mostly lymphoproliferative or myeloproliferative malignancies, lymphomas, leukemias can present with ves uh, vasculitis. Um, in addition, it may also be secondary to solid organ malignancies, um, commonly lung, lung, um, urinary tract um, malignancies, and GI gastrointestinal malignancies as paraneoplastic manifestations. These may uh, precede or uh, present with the malignancy. So, particularly in the in the old patients, when they are more than fifty uh, more than fifty years old patient. And with unknown cause, always you have to think of underlying malignancy and whenever there is poor response to treatment. So this is um, um, this is what uh, I want you to know. This uh, this entity called immune mediated vasculitis. It can be limited to skin or in, uh, involve other organs. So skin biopsy is useful to confirm the presence of leukocytoplastic vasculitis, which is the typical finding in the small vessel vasculitis but it is not typical to, uh, not um, um, not only in immunocomplex mediated vasculitis, 
even in anka vasculitis leukocytoplasmic vasculitis can be seen so treatment of vasculitis depends on uh, the underlying disease and extent of other organ involvement okay, thank you for listening thank you very much monica uh, for the in very informative uh, presentation uh, there are a few questions from the audience uh, the first one is uh, the case you described on cryoglobulinemia is it a case of cryoglobulinemia with mgus um yes they are they are is uh, yeah mgus was there yeah so it's like cryo so we suspected cryoglobulin vasculitis but there was cryoglobulin were negative repeatedly yeah so it is yeah because cryoglobulinemia can even the type 2 and type 3 where the rheumatoid factor is positive it can be secondary to lymphoproliferative diseases so it is mgus related cryoglobulinemia mix uh, yeah mix cryoglobulinemia but it's mgus related yes yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. The, the, the next question is how common cryoglobulinemic vasculitis to have negative cryoglobulinis, cryoglobulinis in as in the, that patient? Yes. So to diagnose for diagnosis criteria, so cry, presence of cryoglobulinis is a must. But if the everything is uh, compatible with cryoglobulinic vasculitis and if it is not explained by any other disease. So we may diagnose. On the other hand, so type one cryoglobulin, so it's easy to detect. It precipitates easily within, uh, like within few hours or with uh, low uh, temperatures, one four degrees. But type two and three may take time. So we have to keep uh, in low temperatures, almost about one week, seven days. So that may be the reason why we are we even we didn't get the positive report. Uh, but uh, you usually we have to have cryoglobulins to diagnose, but in this patient, rheumatoid factor was positive, cryoglobulins, uh, um, though cryoglobulins are negative, come C4 was low, and having leukocytoplasmic vasculitis, and um, re renal biopsy also compatible with uh, um, cryoglobulins, that's why we diagnose it. But usually it should be present, but if it is suspicious, we may diagnose it in the absence of other explanation. And the other thing is, I think they're supposed to be in theaters, aren't they? Like, I mean, we are supposed to, yes. uh, but, but, but we don't get these reports. Yeah. 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 So if they are cryo cryoglobins are positive, uh, they do the cryocrit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the next question is when double positive anti GBM and P and K, what diagnosis is uh, entertained? Is it good pastures or vaginas? So it is. If anti-glomerular membrane, membrane is present, this is yeah. what is present, it's good yeah. pastures. Good yeah, pastures yeah. usually is PIK positivity. So it's good right. pastures with double positivity. It's not a vaginous or GPA. Right. Thank you very much again, Monica, for the lovely presentation. So we'll uh, move on to the next speaker. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Usha Gauri Saravanamuttu. Uh, she obtained her MD medicine in 2007, uh, specialized in rheumatology and rehabilitation at National Hospital Colombo. She completed her foreign training for two years in Royal Hospital of Preston University Hospital, NHS. Uh, obtained the board certification in 2010, MRCP London, uh, and 2010, and the FRCP UK in 2019. She worked in Lady Ridge Hospital and uh, teaching Hospital Goal as acting consultant, and then worked at Teaching Hospital Anuradhapura, DGH Mathara, and DGH Kaluthara. Now working as consultant in rheumatologist and rehabilitation specialist at NHSL Colombo. Her special interests are connective tissue disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, and osteoarthritis. And she has academic interest to involve in under the postgraduate and medicine and teaching exams. Oh, okay. Over to you, Usha. So today I want to discuss the diagnostic uh, workup of the rheumatoid and uh, arthritis and treatment guidelines. Next, rheumatoid arthritis, the following topics today I am going to discuss the introduction, risk factors, early diagnostics, diagnostic criteria, differential diagnosis, investigation and management guidelines. 
Rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic systemic inflammatory autoimmune condition associated with periods of exacerbation and remission. It is characterized by synovitis and joint destruction mediated by cytokines, chemokines, and metalloproteinases. It affects any part of the body, but commonly affects the peripheral joints, mainly proximal interphalangeal joint, metacarpophalangeal joint, and wrist joint, as well as the ankle and metatarsophalangeal joint. The risk factors, uh, the triggering and etiologing factors are unknown. But there are some risk factors associated with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, female sex, age mainly at middle age, but any age group can be affected by rheumatoid arthritis. Any kind of stress like after accident, any fall or myocardial infarction, they are prone to get rheumatoid arthritis, family history, smoking and obesity. The complication, it can cause diffuse osteoporosis, Rheumatoid nodules, Sjogren's syndrome with tri eyes and tri mouth, carpal tunnel syndrome, heart problem with ischemic heart disease, aortic regurgitation and valvular heart disease, lung fibrosis. They are more prone to get lymphoma and they are more prone to get infections like influenza, pneumonia, shingles, and COVID 19, which needs vaccination. Clinical features the onset is insidious but 10% can present with acute onset. Initially, they present with vague presentation like fatigue, malaise, morning stiffness, weight loss, and low weight fever. The illness progress to joint inflammation and swelling with difficulty in performing activity of daily living like dressing, standing, walking, etc. Morning stiffness more than 30 minutes and symmetrical symptoms affect both sides of the body. The pain and swelling affect the wrist, hands, and fingers with subcutaneous nodule formation. Rheumatoid arthritis requires early evaluation and diagnosis and management, which is associated with the improved outcome. Treatment decision should be followed a uh, shared decision. To, for the diagnosis earlier, 1987, American uh, rheumatology Association made a revised criteria, which was used for a long time. It contains seven category of um, presentation, which should be lasted for more than six weeks. At least four should be there to make the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. Next. But uh, uh, the 1987 criteria, which distinguished established rheumatoid arthritis patient from those uh, with other form of arthritis, but uh, and identify the rheumatoid arthritis at a later stage, but it fails to diagnose some patient with very early rheumatoid arthritis who might benefit most from the initiation of early aggressive treatment. The presence of arthritis involves the hand joints, symmetrical involvement, and rheumatoid nodules, which are features at a very late stage, not a very early stage, to my, make the diagnosis from this criteria. The intervention early enough of the disease cause is to prevent the joint destruction and following inflammation. The advantages, advances of understanding of pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis or the past two records. Identify the cytokines that promote the synovial inflammation. Example, TNF factor interleukin one and six lead to treatment causes that affect the disease process itself beyond the alleviation of symptoms. And in addition, the entry citrullinated protein antibodies are the biomarkers that predict the aggressive disease. With this very early stage diagnosis is very important for that American College of Rheumatology and EULA, the European League of um, uh, Interest in Rheumatology 2010 rheumatoid arthritis classification criteria is formed. The new 2010 ACR EULA criteria has four main domains. The first one, joint symptoms that score zero to five score. Serology include rheumatoid factor and anti ACP antibody, that is anti-citrullinated protein antibodies that include anti-CCP and MCV antibodies. MCV mutated citrullinated 
Vimentin antibodies, that's called zero to three months. Symptom duration less than six weeks and more than two weeks, six weeks, uh, zero and one marks. And acute phase reaction, zero and one mark. This chart shows how the arthritis classification criteria is elaborated regarding the joint zero to five points, but there is no marks for single large joint involvement. Two to 10 large joints, one marks. One to three small joint, only two marks. Four to 10 joints, only small joints, only four marks. If more than 10 joints involvement with at least one small joint, the patient get five scoring. Like that uh, serology, three scoring, acute phase reaction, high ESR or CRP, one or two, um, uh, zero or one mark, if elevated one mark. Like that uh, duration, more than six weeks, uh, one mark. So according to this criteria setup, we can make the diagnosis when ESR and CRP are normal. Next. The ACR EULA 2010 rheumatoid arthritis criteria, the total point is 10 out of six is enough to make the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. Regarding the joint symptoms referred to and swollen and tender joints on examination. So examination, put the hand over the second metacarpophalangeal joint and over the fifth interphalangeal joint and squeeze that. If the patient developed tenderness, that is a very significant sign of rheumatoid arthritis. Like that forefoot squeezing sign also, very important sign in rheumatoid arthritis. And if uh, the clinically there is no tenderness or swelling, it can be uh, confirmed by imaging. Large joints means shoulder, elbow, hip, knee, and ankle. Small joint means MCP joint, PIP joint, and second to fifth metacarpophalangeal joint thumb, interphalangeal joint, and wrist joint. This is the important find, the distal interphalangeal joint, and the first CMG joint, and first metacarpophalangeal meta meta joints are included from the assessment. Sorry, the MCP joint. Next. The rheumatoid factor, if negative, zero scoring. If that is positive, we have to do the teeter of the antibodies. If uh, more than uh, normal, but less than three, uh, three times uh, of the normal limit, only two marks. If the theta is more than three times of normal, that score three points. ESR and CRP if normal zero and elevated one mark. Duration of the symptoms, patient cell report that Appropriate, appropriate patients in home and erosions is characteristic of rheumatoid arthritis is already evidence, evidence on a plain radiography is classified as rheumatoid arthritis without applying for the scoring system. Next. So uh, very quickly, I will discuss this differential diagnosis, osteoarthritis, mainly the uh, nodular osteoarthritis or non-nodular osteoarthritis. Systemic lupus erythematosus, so in very young patient, better look at the features of SLE, Lyme's disease, polyarticular gout. The picture, second picture shows the gouty tophi and small joint involvement in the gout. Fibromyalgia, when there's a diffuse generalized joint uh, symptoms, uh, but no significant swelling, better look for the tender points and other features of fibromyalgia and stills disease. Investigation, uh, rheumatoid uh, factor with theta, anti-CCP antibodies and anti-MCV antibodies, inflammatory markers like ESR and CRP, ANA when indicated patients, and full blood count, liver renal function. Next. Investigation, simple plain radiography is indicated mainly for the hand x-rays that shows soft tissue swelling, carpal bone crowding, as well as the periarticular osteopenia. Damage of bone erosions are expected in a very late stage. If uh, X-ray is not uh, helping us, we can go for the MRI scan or ultrasound scan. It's a very useful investigation in other countries. Table site ultrasound is available. It is not available yet in Sri Lanka. Next. 
the common wordings in rheumatoid arthritis is important for the further uh, discussion. DMARTS means disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs. Triple therapy means hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, plus methotrexate or leflonamide. CS DMARTS are the conventional or synthetic DMARTS that include methotrexate, leflonamide, sulfasalazine, or hydroxychloroquine. B DMARTS are biologic DMARTS. Rituximab, tocilizumab, TNF and, uh, inhibitors like adalimumab, golimumab, pitanacept, infliximab. Most of the biologics are available in Sri Lanka. TS DMARTs, targeted synthetic DMARTs. Those are the JAK kinase inhibitors in Sri Lanka. Tofacitinib is available. Varicinitib and opadacitinib are available in other countries. The medical management. For the management 2021 American College of Rheumatology guidelines are published recently. Uh, both strong and conditional recommendations are given in that guidelines. In addition, 2019 update of EULA recommendation for the management of rheumatoid arthritis is available. These recommendations do not dictate the care of the patient. We have to make the um, these. Uh, no. Uh, it is. Uh, it should be made uh, tailor-made management should be given for each and every patient. The medical management first in the CIDs non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that include diaclofenac, ibuprofen, celecoxib, entrocoxib, melacoxib should be given to control the pain and inflammation. ACR 2015 and EULA 2016 update recommended in a CID should be prescribed with the lowest dose to provide the symptoms relief. Once the DMARTs start to work, it should be reduced. Corticosteroid is a steroid oral as well as intraarticular and uh, IV preparations are useful, but lowest dose possible for the shortest period is recommended. It should not more than 10 milligram, but recommended less than 7.5 milligram per day often given in a divided doses like five milligram twice. It should be supplemented with the calcium 800 to 1000 milligram and vitamin D 400 to 800 milligrams. The, it is a bridging therapy. And once the DMARTs started to work, the tapering of prednisolone should be slowly, if possible, one milligram uh, over the weeks or months should be done. So disease modifying drugs, DMARTs in rheumatoid arthritis. The DMARTs has a lot of recommendation. The DMART should be started as soon as the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis is made. The aim uh, to reach the target of sustained remission or low disease activity. So monitoring of the disease activity every one to three months and no improvement at the three months or at the uh, not uh, reach the target at a six months, therapy should be adjusted. Methotrexate is the treatment strategy. Next. The contraindication to methotrexate in early, for example, pregnant and breastfeeding mother or early intolerance with the methotrexate, leflonomide or sulfasalazine should be considered as the first treatment, but leflonomide is contraindicated in pregnancy as well as breastfeeding. Short term steroid when we are switching the cons um, conservative uh, DMARTs, the small uh, dose of steroid can be given and very quickly that should be um, tailed off. If the treatment target is not achieved with the one um, con uh, conventional DMART, if there is no absence of prognostic, for prognostic signs, we can combine with the second or third Conventional DMARTs. Next time. So, methotrexate monotherapy. The recommendation favors methotrexate monotherapy. It is strongly recommended over the hydroxychloroquine or sulfasalazine in a new patient with moderate to high disease activity. And it is conditionally recommended over the dual or triple therapy but because of the high burden of the uh, combination therapy, 
but these recommendation are conditional if patient prefer we can give the dual or triple therapy the methotrexate is recommended over the leflunomide as a first treatment in a new case with high disease activity it is recommended over the biologic demand so targeted synthetic demand monotherapy it is recommended over methotrexate plus the tumor necrosing factor treatment so in a low disease activity rheumatoid arthritis a new patient hydroxychloroquine is conditionally recommended over the other conventional demands sulfasalazine is conditionally recommended over the methotrexate so a new patient with a very mild illness we can start hydroxychloroquine and then sulfasalazine the how to administrate methotrexate oral methotrexate is conditionally recommended over the sulfasalazine at the beginning initiation and titration of the methotrexate to weekly dose up to 15 mg over 4 to 6 months is conditionally recommended over initiation and titration to a weekly dose 15 mg this means better start 10 7.5 to 10 mg and very quickly titrate the dose within 4 to 6 weeks up to 15 mg the split dose of oral methotrexate over 24 hours is recommended and subcut injection weekly is recommended if necessary we can increase folic or folinic acid that is conditional steroid when uh, we are starting a new conventional demat or biologic demats or when we are switching the dose Uh, we can add a small dose of steroid but that should be tapered very quickly next so remission talk uh, treat the target is the aim which refers the monitoring of the disease activity used by uh, validated instruments like das 28 and modification of treatment to minimize disease activity that is called disease low disease activity or remission recommendation specify that patient with a target at least for 6 months should be there before tapering the drug so once the remission is achieved continue the medication for the next 6 months then tapering of the biologic demats or targeted synthetic demats is recommended even after that if persistent remission tapering of conventional demat could be considered dose reduction is recommended then discontinuation gradual discontinuation is sulfasalazine is recommended over other hydroxychloric you know other demat so when we are trying to tail off first uh, tail off started to tail off with sulfasalazine rheumatoid arthritis is regarded as a incurable disease therefore a drug that has proven efficacy and tolerated well by the patient should not be stopped with regards to the question whether stopping the versus continuation with a small dose on remission there is no new trials are found but all trials comparing these uh, showing remi even after remission significant increase of flare up rate is there next so recommendation now i am going to very quickly discuss about the recommendation for the some specific patient population subcutaneous nodules with rheumatoid arthritis methotrexate is conditionally recommended but if severe progressive subcutaneous nodule nodulosis as shown in the picture switch on to another demat next pulmonary diseases again methotrexate is conditionally recommended if a patient with mild disease or stable airway disease or a disease ne ne recently detected when imaging was done but pre existing lung disease is a risk factor for methotrexate related pneumonitis however the alternative demats are also having a lung side effects so recommendation is conditionally decided by the rheumatologist or pulmonologist uh, regarding the lung, lung toxicity but all the patient should uh, inform about the uh, methotrexate pneumonitis when we start the new treatment of 
with the methotrexate. Next. Heart failure. Again, uh, conventional DMARTs are indicated. But when we are moving to the biologic DMARTs, better avoid TNF inhibitors. Non-TNF uh, biologic drugs should be uh, used mainly for the NYHA class 3 and 4 heart failure. These recommendations are given according to the trials of TNF inhibitors to the patients uh, class 3 and 4 heart failure without rheumatoid arthritis. Next. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, nephil is a common problem we are facing. Again, methotrexate is conditionally recommended for the nephil patient with normal liver enzyme and liver function tests are normal. But risk of hepatitis, the hepatic toxicity with FTX is high in patient with liver fibrosis stage three or four, even though liver enzymes are normal. So non-invasive testing to diagnose and stage the liver fibrosis with the help of hepatologist or gastroenterologist should be done before starting the methotrexate. In addition, frequent monitoring, four to eight weeks monitoring is important. Next. In lymphoproliferative disease, Pritixmab is conditionally recommended over any other DMARTs. If a new patient straight away go for Rituximab, if a patient on any other DMARTs, better change to Rituximab. Next. Previous area, serious infection occurred within 24 months. A conventional DMARTs are recommended over biologic or targeted uh, DMARTs. Switching to the DMARTs. Conventional DMARTs is important than steroid. Better avoid steroid in those patients. Next. So my last slide, surgery in rheumatoid arthritis. The medication failed or prevent the damage of the joint. Some surgery to repair the joint is recommended. Surgery may restore the ability to use the joint as well as surgery will reduce the pain and improve the function of the patient. What are the kind of surgeries we can do? Sinovectomy. Surgeon will remove the inflamed lining of the joint, the thickened synovium, to reduce the pain and improve the joint flexibility, tendon repair. The inflamed synovium, panacinus, enter into the tendon and causing tendon rupture. So surgeon will repair the tendons. And joint fusion, as shown in the last picture, surgically fuse the joint that will stabilize or realign the joint for the pain relief. So in summary, rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic inflammatory autoimmune condition with a period of exacerbation of remission. Triggering is unknown, but female sex, genetic stress, smoking, environmental factors are contributing. Risk of developing osteoporosis, nodulosis, Sjogren's syndrome, carpal tunnel syndrome, heart and lung complications are common. Diagnostic criteria and management guidelines are there for the early diagnosis and treatment to target. The DMARTs include conventional biologics and targeted synthetic drugs are available. For the selection should be specified for the patient population. There are guidelines to um, uh, consider. Sometimes surgical interventions are needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Usha, for the lovely presentation. There's one question. Uh, even though guidelines recommend a monotherapy in newly diagnosed RA, most patients, uh, uh, most practice is to start uh, triple therapy in rheumat rheumatologic clinics. Uh, I don't know who is writing this. Uh, what is the rationale behind this? Yeah, that is depending on the rheumatologist. Um, uh, decision. Um, some uh, rheumatologists are practicing the triple therapy, but uh, for my knowledge, most of the our uh, rheumatologists are using monotherapy or uh, dual therapy with methotrexate plus hydroxychloroquine because hydroxychloroquine has less side effects. Um, but uh, patient decision and uh, rheumatologist decision is important to give the uh, drugs. But monotherapy is recommended in the guidelines. And I suppose it is easier when we get a side effect, we know uh, to which medication uh, he, the patient got it, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
So there is one more question. Uh, what is the first line treatment for pain in rheumatoid arthritis? Is it NSAID or steroids? So uh, for the pain management, uh, NSAIDs are indicated, but steroid will reduce the inflammation. So some very small dose because seven, less than 7.5 is recommended. Uh, so if necessary, we can give small dose of NSAIDs as well as a very small dose of steroids for a short time to reduce the pain in the patient. But pain management is not very important because that won't prevent the erosions and complications. So we have to uh, monitor the blood test and gradually increase the dose of DMARS to achieve the target. And they usually respond very well to, a, uh, to steroids, I suppose. No? Like I mean, rather than combining steroids and NSAIDs, uh, like what we usually do these days is to give steroids and see, isn't it? But uh, in our country, the problem is when patient pain, uh, develop pain, and if we are not uh, prescribing anything, patient yeah. will buy the pain drugs from the pharmacy. The, that is a dangerous thing. So my personal opinion is better give a small dose of uh, NSAIDs at the beginning, and we have to advise the side effects of NSAIDs and advise them to take when needed. Right. Uh, Dr. Kolita Selahewa is asking a question. Uh, if a patient on methotrexate develops pulmonary fibrosis, how can one decide whether it is due to uh, MTX or a complication of rheumatoid disease? Yeah. Uh, at this point, uh, the radiologist and uh, pulmonologist uh, play a major role. So we will go for the uh, high resolution CT scan and the, uh, the uh, clinical presentation. In pneumonitis, it's a different presentation like patient develop fever, cough, uh, very ill health, and blood stain uh, sputum. So we have to think about the pneumonitis and uh, supportive HRCT um, will give us uh, some evidence whether this is a pneumonitis or uh, disease uh, uh, induced for lung fibrosis. So if pneumonitis, we have to withdraw the methotrexate, but for the lung fibrosis, now the recommendation is methotrexate. Yeah, if it is a newly onset one, it is easy to, easy to differentiate, isn't it? If it's a long standing, sometimes it is not that easy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there is one more question. Uh, if steroids are given for a short term, what is the reason to give calcium and vitamin D? Yeah. Because uh, our patient uh, nutritional level may be very low. And in addition, when uh, this uh, mechanism will reduce the calcium level and a lot of our patients come and complain, severe cramps of the muscles. And uh, vitamin D prevent the, vitamin D has a lot of benefits in uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, that will reduce the infection and uh, strengthen the bone. So even for a short time, it is recommended to give uh, calcium and vitamin D. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Usha, again. So we'll move, move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Chaturika Dandenia. Uh, she is an alumnus of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradeniya, passed out in 2009 with first class honors and distinctions in all subjects. She joined her alma mater as a lecturer in 2013 and was promoted to senior lecturer in 2019. In 2016, she was awarded the MD in medicine by the University of Colombo and post underwent post MD training uh, at National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, then uh, her overseas training was at the uh, Addenbrooke's Hospital, Cambridge University Hospitals Trust UK. She was awarded the MRCP in 2017 and uh, became a fellow in 2019 and completed the specialty certificate in rheumatology in 2020. Currently, in addition to her work as a senior lecturer in medicine, she offers her services as an honorary consultant in rheumatology and rehabilitation at the teaching hospital Peradini. She has present, uh, presented research findings at several local and international conferences, including APLA, uh, winning several awards and has published in local and international peer reviewed journals her current research interests include early inflammatory arthritis, SLE, soft tissue research, 
mission she strives to uh, improve rheumatology teaching to undergraduate and postgraduate students using a new teaching methods her topic today is specialty uh, uh, update in systemic lupus erythematosus what is new so over to you chaturika thank you very much sir for that very kind introduction uh, let me share the presentation Um, so, as I said, my topic today is going to be on what is new in SLA to uh, add to the specialty update, the webinar series today. Um, so, moving on to SLA. Now, when we say SLA, what usually pops into our mind can be any of these. So, the, the, the range of manifestations can range from just a few oral ulcers, like very, a myriad of uh, myocutaneous disease, like a variety of skin rashes like this subacute cutaneous lupus shown in the picture, hair loss, which is a pretty common condition, or sometimes even very severe multisystemic involvement uh, leading to even death. So in essence, we all know that SL is a multisystem devastating disease. The outcomes can be pretty bad uh, and can range from mild mucocutaneous disease, as I said, to life and organ threatening disease. Young females, being the lucky us, are usually predominantly affected group. And we know there is a male to female uh, like ratio of one to nine. So, so for every nine females affected, only one male is affected. But in clinical practice, what we see is when males get SLE, the disease is pretty bad. It's uncommon, but again, similarly very bad. Uh, overall, compared to, I would say, the rest of the world in, in rheumatology, in SLA, unfortunately, the progress in care and the outcomes have been extremely painfully slow. So like we know that over the last few decades, last two, three decades, rheumatology as a whole has undergone so many tremendous changes. So there have been so many inter, like new interventions introduced, new medications. In essence, the way that we look at rheumatology has changed as a whole. However, the same change we do not unfortunately see in SLA, and this is due to so many reasons, and we will like try to re uh, like, go through a few of the reasons, but what's new? So as I said, surprisingly little for the last two decades, but as a result of everything that failed, I would say, now we understand the disease better as well as what doesn't work. That is equally as important because as the famous inventor Thomas Alva Edison said, this was like after he failed, uh, like failed more than a thousand times in finding a substance that would work in the tungsten bulb before he finally ended up, ended up with tungsten, a tungsten. And he was asked like, how, how did you feel after failing 10,000 times? And he said, I did not fail. Instead, I have found 10,000 ways that doesn't work. I would say in SLE, we can at least make up our mind, okay, this is at least what is happening. We have found, but doesn't work. Okay, so amidst all this, yes, we have found some new things as well. So this is what, we, what I'm going to talk you through now. So the first new thing is the criteria. So these are, remember, classification criteria. So I, I remember, remind trainees particularly very frequently, do not treat SLE criteria as diagnostic criteria. For that matter, most of the criteria that we use in rheumatology are not diagnostic. They are classification criteria. There's a difference because diagnostic criteria are a set that have been validated to apply to a previously undiagnosed patient to make the diagnosis. Whereas a classification criteria, we apply to a patient who is already clinically diagnosed. We say, okay, clinically, this patient has SLE. Does that patient fulfill the classification criteria? What for? To be included in a research study. So classification criteria were formulated for the first time as a purpose for research. Because we like uh, in, in rheumatology particularly, we find that our disease populations are extremely heterogeneous. Two patients, now if you take two patients with SLE, they are not alike. So this is a big challenge when it comes to research because when we try to like uh, sample patients and then randomize into groups, we find it very difficult to uh, like get a homogeneous population out of all this heterogeneity in the disease. This is where our classification criteria come in. So we all know this one, the 1982 revised 
classification criteria uh, by the American College of Rheumatology. So these included 11 criteria. So this is what, what we have all learned. The, uh, this included 11 out of which if four or more were present, yeah, either serial or simultaneously, it was said that you can classify the patient as having SLE. So like, what are these 11 criteria? So like, why did this need change? So unfortunately, since being like described in 1982, these did not change over the next 40 years. Until 2012, the scientific world accepted this at face value. Nothing much changed. So this goes on to show how much of at a snail pace did research move in the field of SLE. But like the limitations, so this was a good set of criteria as far as sensitivity went, but these are not specific. And the other thing, as the understanding about the disease grew, we started seeing more and more manifestations of the disease, which had no place whatsoever in the criteria. For example, if you take neurologic disorder, and if you go through the initial uh, the paper which presented these studies by Tam uh, and his group, and the neurologic disorder has been described as only two findings. It's either seizures or psychosis without any other explanation. But we know from experience that neurologic disorder in SLA is far wider than that. For example, one European paper has described 27 neurologic manifestations of SLA. So where, where does the rest go? And the other thing is like the, the mucocutaneous manifestations. There are only four described here, the malar rash, discoid rash, photosensitivity, and oral ulcers. But then again, the dermatologist would agree to disagree because there are so many other like dermatological manifestations of SLA. They have no place in there. So things like started to be questioned. So people wanted a change. And the other like the very famous thing in here is the immunology criteria. So here, the immunologic disorder is defined as any one or more of the following. Positive LE cell preparation. So what is this LE cell? I don't think many even know what is LE cell. So this, is, this was defined as a lupus erythematosus cell, which LE stands for, which I'm not going to go into detail because of time restrictions. But we don't even do this now. I don't think anybody has done this beyond about 1995. Then anti-double stranded DNA and anti-Smith antibody we still use, but... Lo and behold, false positive test for BDRL. A false positive test for syphilis was considered as a sort of a classification test for SLA, which is not the best. So this is because of cross-reactivity with antiphospholipid antibodies. We know that now, but we didn't at that time. So like within the scientific community, like the discussions were growing. So people were asking for a change. They wanted something new. So this is when the, the Systemic Lupus International Collaborating Clinics, which is a huge group of like, uh, like professionals from among many countries, but mainly Europeans, got together and came out with an ex extremely good diocese, a set of criteria in 2012. So in this one, there were so many changes, many new changes were added. So for the first time, immunological criteria were made essential. So here the immunologic criteria, now if you see for, for classification, it says in the top, four or more criteria with at least one being clinical and one being laboratory was needed. So that is how this immunologic criteria became mandatory. But it didn't have to be ANA. It could be ANA, anti-DSDNA, and like all the rest here. And also a wide spectrum of dermatologic and neurological manifestations were acknowledged as being part of SLA. Now, if you look at some of these words in front, there is an asterisk superscripted. So this asterisk, like if you see below, it says C need uh, C notes for uh, like criteria details. Again, the uh, the reference article that I have referenced below, uh, the original article by Petri and the group, it described what do you mean by this? Like what is defined as acute cutaneous lupus? What is defined as chronic cutaneous lupus? So if you go through this like a wide range of clinical manifestations which are previously like unrecognized were now included. And obviously the EDRL was removed from the immunologic criteria and instead antiphospholipid antibodies were included. And also the complement, so like during these years, we understood the pathophysiology of SLE more and more. So like we now know that it's mainly a B-cell driven disease with a lot of complement consumption. So as a result, complement C3, C4, and CH50 levels were for the first time included in the immunologic criteria. 
So another very important point was a positive ANA or a double stranded DNA with a biopsy proven lupus nephritis was considered enough to classify as SLE. I would say like for the nephrologists, this was a huge breakthrough because they would agree that they see quite a lot of patients who come like with just the renal manifestations. You do the biopsy, typical histologic features of lupus nephritis are seen along with a positive ANA, but they have no other extra renal disease. So if you went according to the just the previous criteria, you cannot classify this patient as having SLE. We can diagnose because like at the end of the day, SLE remains a clinical diagnosis. So you can diagnose, but these patients cannot find their way into any of the lupus trials because they cannot be classified as having SLE. So this was a major breakthrough in the uh, like management and the trials ongoing in the field of uh, like lupus nephritis. Seven years later, 2019, the American College of Rheumatology and the EULA, they were not very happy with the SLICC group because they were surpassed, perhaps. So they got together and decided, okay, we are going to come up with something new. But competition is good, I would say, in a way, because these even refined uh, the SLICC, SLICC criteria to the betterment. In this one, for the first time, we are seeing a weighted criteria. So what do we mean by a weighted criteria? So you can see in front of these like different manifestations, there is a number included. So to explain what is this weighted, I would just take up the mucocutaneous. Now, if you see non-scarring alopecia, it is given two marks, an acute cutaneous lupus, which here is defined as the, as the male rash, you get six marks. If you look at, think about a patient that you have seen, okay, non-scarring alopecia, in Sri Lanka, of the female population, what is the percentage do you think that has non-scarring alopecia? I have it, I would say, because it, it's so common. So if you take 10 patients, 10 females, nine would say that they have hair loss. So it's very difficult to determine, is this lupus hair loss or is this just non-specific hair loss? Whereas if a patient comes with the, with the male rash, the butterfly rash, the likelihood that this is due to SLA is much higher compared to a non-specific non-scarring alopecia. So as a result, the weightage that you would give to a patient with a male rash is, should be definitely different than to the weight that you should give to non-scarring alopecia. So this is why the difference in the marks. Okay, so I, I hope that is clear. And also an interesting fact was that for these classification criteria, ANA was considered as the entry criterion. So these could only be applied if the patient had an ANA was positive at a T of one in 80 or more. So the starting data was one in 80. And very, I was very happy to see this because fever was for the first time recognized as a symptom of SLE because you would agree with me, how many patients with SLE do we see with fever? But up until this time, fever was not taken as a classification criteria, like classification symptom, classifying symptom for SLE. So here, if you have excluded the other possible causes, fever was considered as a potential symptom. And the weighted scoring system I already explained. So this is what we came up, like what has developed as a new in the diagnostic, uh, sorry, the classification criteria. So I have a few questions for you. So does the negative double standard DNA exclude SLA? Or for that matter, a negative ANA, does that exclude SLA? Because frequently I hear this term from trainees as well as sometimes others saying we did the lupus screen in the patient which was negative. To me, that makes no sense whatsoever because there is no diagnostic test for lupus. If there was, we would be the happiest of all because lupus is such a challenging diagnosis. If there was one diagnostic test, that would be really great. But remember, a negative DSDNA does not exclude SLE. So sometimes I have seen patients with a positive ANA done a DSDNA because it is negative. Okay, it can't be SLE. There's no such thing. Because remember, double standard DNA, although has a higher specificity, has a comparatively very low sensitivity. So not all patients with a positive ANA will have a double standard DNA, if they, even if they have a cell. And a negative ANA also does not exclude SLA. So we, I, I think the at least the rheumatologists in the audience will agree with me because we see quite frequently patients who have all the clinical features, but having a negative ANA. 
This may be because of evolving disease. They might test positive for ANA on a later date, or else they might have an as yet undiscovered antibody that we don't know about. Because what you need to understand is these ANA and double standard DNA, these are not pathogenic antibodies. They are just there, uh, like present in a patient with uh, SLA, but they are not pathogenic. Okay? Right. So the second new point. So as I said, being females, we are the lucky lot who are going to get SLA more commonly. So consequently, there are so many ladies' issues, so specific female issues that need to be discussed. So women's health and rheumatological disease slash SLA PLS is a hot topic because of this. There are so many new developments happening in this area. There were two main papers that came out over the last few years. One, I, I love this paper because this is only a very few pages and I would highly recommend uh, for it, particularly by postgraduate trainees. This is the 2016 EULA recommendations for women's health and management of family planning and all the other like reproductive health issues. And the second one came out in 2020. This is the American College of Rheumatology guideline, again, for the same thing, but generally in rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases, not just in SLE. However, the, the majority of this guideline, I would say more than 80% of this is dedicated to SLE and APLS. So as a summary, what things in all of this? Pregnancy in SLE and APLS to be embraced rather than feared. So over the years, there has been a change, uh, like a complete paradigm shift in thinking, because usually when a patient comes to the clinic or with a diagnosis of like background of SLE and APLS and tells you I'm pregnant, your response is not very positive because we all get very worried. Okay, what are we going to do with this patient? But now what the experts are saying is this may be this particular patient's only opportunity at getting pregnant because we know there are so many fertility related issues that can happen in these conditions. So rather than fearing it, try to embrace the pregnancy, try to think about what you can do rather than what you can't do. So that was fun. And all through this, we have got a new knowledge in planned conception and peripartum management. So now we know what to tell patients like females about like when can you get pregnant rather than telling don't get pregnant, we know to tell them, okay, you can get pregnant if you are like if you fulfill all this. So we will tell you when you can get pregnant. So we'll have an open dialogue. Please discuss with us beforehand. So now we are able to offer them that advice as well as a sound management plan for the peripartum period. And the safety and efficacy of hydroxychloroquine in pregnancy and breastfeeding. So I will be talking about this topic in a little while, but what you need to remember is this is now well established. Hydroxychloroquine is an extremely safe medication in pregnancy as well as breastfeeding. Also, traditionally, most of us have learned that combined oral contraceptive pill, anything containing estrogen should not be given in women with SLE. That was the traditional teaching. However, Again, now we know better. So in those who only have SLA without APLS, combined oral contraceptive pill is not contraindicated. This remains a therapeutic option. So this is particularly good news for low resource settings where birth control with like high five, particularly progesterone only things which are more expensive is limited. And across patients, those who have SLA plus or minus APLS, regardless of disease severity, IUCD is considered the most effective method of birth control. At one time, there was concern regarding IUCD and associated high infection risk because this would be a foreign body, but now we know evidence suggests otherwise. So just a copper IUCD is enough. Again, it does not have to be a myrina. And interestingly, this is again very new evidence, very fresh evidence coming in saying now uh, the dipomidroxy progesterone acetate, DMPA injections. We think that because it is uh, like progesterone only, it should be okay in ABLS, but not really. The data suggests that the risk of PTE, venous thromboembolism, in those who receive DMPA is equivalent to getting estrogen containing contraceptives. So it is now considered contraindicated. And also very interestingly, uh, like those who are on DMPA are apparently at a high risk of developing osteoporosis and resultant fractures. Again, we don't know why. This is under assessment. 
another interesting thing is GnRH analog in fertility preservation in patients receiving cyclophosphamide. Remember, this may not be possible if you are using cyclophosphamide as a life or organ saving sort of emergency treatment. However, if like on more planned, on more subacute use of GN, uh, like cyclophosphamide, use of GnRH analogs has now come up to preserve fertility. So these are the new things that have come up in female cells. A new thing about new drugs. So if you go through the list, over the last 10 years, or rather the 20 years, I would say, only two new drugs have been approved in the use of SLE. The first one, we all know, Belimumab, which was approved for use in renal lupus. And the second one is the newest addition. This was approved only August last year, 2021. It's called Anifrolumab, which is a type 1 interferon receptor inhibiting monoclonal antibody. This work seems to be working well in those who have like resistant cutaneous and musculoskeletal disease. Experimentally, obinutumab is another humanized like type 2 anti-CD20 antibody, which is which was like originally introduced as a cancer chemotherapy. There are ongoing trials and the initial phase two findings have been very encouraging, but we still don't have the final results. But if you look at the amount of failed medication, you will realize what I meant by knowing what we did, what we should not be doing, or like knowing what, what doesn't work. Because there were so many. So like lack of new medications is not due to lack of trying. We have tried, but things have gone wrong. So even rituximab, although the real world the data is promising and we very widely use rituximab, trial-wise, evidence-wise, explore and lunar trials, which are like which are very frequently cited have shown no benefit, no added benefit. And the, all the other tongue twisting names, so these are all the, the other NIVA additions to the biologic family, but all, all of them so far have not been approved. The fourth new thing about the safety of existing medication. With uh, regard to rituximab, a big concern is the risk of infection. So again, very early 2022, so this year, they uh, published the, some of the initial data from the BILAC BR study. So this is an ongoing study in the United Kingdom, a multi-center trial, and they have published data to say that rituximab does not significantly increase the risk of infection compared to conventional standard treatment. But in interpreting this data, what you need to remember is here the conventional standard treatment arm comprises significant high steroid dosing. So in other words, what we are saying is, compared to high-dose steroids, which we know increases the risk of infection, rituximab is not any worse. So it doesn't mean that rituximab does not cause infection. It's like compared to high-dose steroids, it's not really. But when it comes to hydroxychloroquine in pregnancy, there are several well-designed trials that provide evidence to support that pregnancy and breastfeeding, hydroxychloroquine is completely safe. There is no increased risk of birth defects or any risk to the child. And the final new thing, what we know is what should not be done. Steroids should not be abused. Remember, steroids are not truly disease modifying. In like rheumatological diseases, we define steroid, uh, like we define a disease modifying drug. Uh, like one of the properties of a disease modifying drug is to be steroid sparing which also means steroids are not disease modifying. And also evidence of steroid related damage accrual worsening disease outcome are now abundant. So steroids might kill the patient at the end rather than the disease killing them. And do not wait until all the boxes are checked for the diagnosis. So maintain a high degree of clinical suspicion and refer early. So there is a very significant change in the way that immunosuppression is managed in SLE. Therefore, please hand out to the specialists and do not treat classification criteria as diagnostic. Because before a patient with SLE fulfills, like ticks all the boxes in the classification criteria, it can take sometimes up to a decade from the time of the onset of the first symptom if you go back in the history. And by the time you finally realize this is SLE, you may be way too late. To summarize, we now have renewed and more scientific classification criteria. And we have filled gaps in evidence on the management of women's reproductive health issues in SLE and antiphospholipid syndrome. There are new medications. Although there are more failures rather than successes, there are ongoing efforts. We have not given up.
there are better established safety data for already used medications. And we be, all, more than all, we now know what not to do. To limit use of steroids, not to use steroids as disease-modifying treatment, and early diagnosis and early referral with multidisciplinary care. Thank you so much. Uh, th thank you very much, Chaturika, for the lovely and informative presentation. Uh, there are a few questions. Like, uh, I think you perhaps you answered this question in your last couple of slides. If those are classification criteria, what is the diagnostic criteria? Please explain. There is, uh, for SLA at the moment, there is no diagnostic criteria. If you go through yeah. all of these, like the original papers, they will say at the end of the table, SLA remains a clinical diagnosis. You look at the, because like medicine is always about pattern recognition. I would say in rheumatology, this is more true, more than like any other specialty. So we recognize the pattern of the patient. So it comes with expertise and classification criteria, you apply only to a clinically diagnosed patient. That is what is important. So for SLA, up to now, there is no diagnostic criteria. Right, thank you. If ANA is negative, is it not SLA? Uh, again, in one of the slides, I explained this. You can have ANA negative patients with SLA. So like, for example, I currently have one patient who is like just a 15 year old girl. She came with typical oral ulcers. The photo that I showed of oral ulcers was from her. So we know that like so, the palatal ulcers, endless palatal ulcers, very typical of SLE. And she even had the malar rash and the inflammatory arthritis, but the ANA is negative. I do not want to wait until she has a positive ANA to start managing the patient. So at the moment, the diagnosis, the clinical diagnosis is SLD. So negative ANA does not exclude the disease because remember, none of these, these tests have a hundred percent sensitivity. You have like ANA, the sensitivity is about 90 to 95%. So which means five to 10% will have a negative ANA. And the other thing, we may, there may be many other antibodies that we do not know about that may be positive. The best example being anti-CCP antibody. So up until recently, we took rheumatoid arthritis. The only thing that we knew was rheumatoid factor. But recently we have found anti-CCP antibodies much more sensitive, much more specific compared to the rheumatoid factor. So there may be new things that are coming up in the future. So again, remember, negative ANA does not exclude the disease. All right, so this is not a question actually, it's a statement still can't understand this new classification criteria in SLE. You want to say anything about it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what I would say there is like the, the new, new classification criteria. So probably you, uh, I, I assume you are like referring to the, uh, the 2019 ACR EULA criteria. It, it is not com as complex as you think. If you like really go through each of the, the, uh, the subheadings, each of the domains that have been like selected there, you will see that this is a very sensible criteria. The only thing is there are different weights attributed to each of the symptoms. That is to say some symptoms are more representative of SLE compared to the others. Now, another example is the, is the renal. So in renal, class three, uh, sorry, class two and class five, have less marks compared to class uh, uh, class two and class four, sorry, class three and class four. Because class three and class four, if you ask from a histopathologist, they would tell you that the findings are much more specific. There are more histologically specific features that you see only in SL. Whereas if you take class five, for example, it's membranous nephropathy. You know, like as postgraduate trainees, we have learned lists of courses for membranous nephropathy. So just having class five lupus nephritis does not fulfill the classification criteria because it has only eight marks. So you need two more, which means you need something else in addition. In addition to a positive ANA, because positive ANA is the entry criterion. So in a patient with a positive ANA and a class five lupus nephritis, to, to classify this as lupus nephritis, you need at least one more clinical symptom or sign. That's what it means. So like, if, if you're interested in doing rheumatology, come to me and then I will explain more, but like, it, it can be a bit complex, but if you take your time and go through the criteria, they are not as complex as you think. Uh, thank you very much, Shatrika. There are, I mean, I think there are a lot of questions coming up. I hope you will be able to sort of post the answers to them. Uh, so as the, like our time has come up, I thank you again, Shatrika, for the lovely lecture.
uh, and uh, I thank all the audience and uh, uh, the College of uh, Ceylon College of Physicians for inviting us. Uh, then over to you, Arusha. Uh, right. Thank you very much. That was a very profound uh, session. I myself found uh, it very useful. Thank you, Chaturika, for explaining the rationale behind the score based diagnostic. I mean, now that you know, you, if you think about it, it really makes a lot of sense you know, because some things are more likely, some things are less likely. So that's a fantastic, uh, a fantastic uh, set of four lectures. Even the others were absolutely fantastic. So thank you very much. I'm very grateful to the College of uh, Rheumatology and uh, uh, Rehabilitation for for organizing such an excellent session. I look forward, I invite all of you to join tomorrow's lecture as well. And for anybody who missed this, it will be available on the CCP uh, YouTube channel. So you can encourage your friends to visit the CCP YouTube channel and listen to all these lectures again. They will be kept there <clears throat> and then invite you for tomorrow's lecture. Uh, I'm very grateful to the College of Rheumatology, the four speakers, <coughs> the president, Dr. Duminda Basinga, as well as Nalina and his IT team, which all, as always does a meticulous job. And also the CCP team of uh, demonstrators who put together you know, all the publicity and the posters and so on and so forth. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, have a pleasant afternoon. Please continue to join our CCP activities and join tomorrow as well. We had a huge audience today. I hope all of you join tomorrow as well. Thank you very much. Have a pleasant afternoon all. Thank, Thank you very much.